All right, I believe we are live. Good afternoon. Uh, today is February 18th, Friday. This is United Medical Economic Care Organization. My name is Kamal Arkan. Uh, as usual, we are going to go through some updates uh, from uh, COVID-19, and we do have our guest uh, speakers today from the state of Delaware. Um, and uh, we are going to start with the vaccine updates first. Um, so, uh, and then I will introduce our guest uh, speaker for today. Um, so let me make sure, so we did, uh, you know, updating. I was just told that I'm echoing. Uh, so this is what happens, so I get updates. Um, Right, so this is um, so I just update the audio setting. If the echo is still happening, I can look into it, but um, just waiting for staff to. Uh, confirm. So um, while I'm going through that trouble, <laughs> uh, Sean, we can actually give the updates on the vaccine um, where we are right now. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, for an interest in time, uh, we can definitely go ahead and get started with our COVID updates. Um, overall, case-wise, uh, the U.S. had a decrease um, in the weekly average uh, the previous week. So as last Friday, we had around 234,000 cases. This week we are down to around 155. So pretty significant drop right there as we see that curve uh, continuing uh, to kind of really dramatically drop downward um, in our cases. As far as the vaccines go, the US uh, is up another 4 million this week in overall uh, vaccines being administered. So that is continuing with that slow uptrend over time um, as we go into the spring months here. And then in regards to the U.S. versus Delaware comparison, we have the uh, nation as a whole is now up over 214 million um, people being fully vaccinated. And of those, 92.2 million uh, have actually received their booster. And then in the side margin, as always, we have Delaware's comparison percentage-wise so it seems that we're increasing um, on average about two tenths of a percent in each of those columns uh, kind of over the last couple of weeks, we've seen that. Um, so overall, again, our population being over the age of 65 is still the uh, highest rate of vaccination, again, because of the initial availability of the vaccines being made available to the elderly population and those at higher risk. So overall steadily increasing and that trend is going up and the cases are going down. So good, good signs. Well, those are, those are all good signs. I know uh, last night at our provider meeting, uh, we are meeting every week, uh, every Thursday night. So uh, hospitalization numbers are down to low 100s. Uh, I think it was the critical cases were uh, 10 or 11 total for the state of Delaware. Um, so I think we are getting better. But still, uh, we uh, have to watch out what may be coming back. Uh, so there are still some unknowns that we are going to be dealing with. So uh, today, I want to make sure that we don't spend um, too much time before. Uh, normally, we do uh, go through almost like 10, 15 minutes in the beginning. So I do want to bring uh, Mary Jo uh, Condon uh, for, uh, as our guest speaker. Uh, so she's already on the screen. Um, so, Mirjo, uh, welcome to our session. How are you doing? No, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm doing well. It's good to be here. So, um, while well, we are having these live uh, sessions um, every week, so usually the format is, we, we actually, we started doing this for a long time. Now, uh, the format uh, every week, um, one, one week we do clinical, and the other week we try to bring someone from the state or one of our um, uh, state officials, um, so they come and um, give us updates. So, um, and then uh, as an accountable care organization, I thought it would be um, important to have you um, and uh, actually understand what your office does um, mm -hmm. 
uh, what you do for Delaware. Um, and just to better uh, you have a better idea what may be coming through our way. So if you can actually maybe introduce yourself first, and then uh, I have a couple of questions, and then we'll just go from there. Sure, that sounds great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mary Jo Compton. Um, I serve as director of the Office of Value-Based Healthcare Delivery for the state of Delaware. Um, the office sits within the Department of Insurance. Um, and uh, I'm also um, a senior consultant with Friedman Healthcare. So essentially in that capacity as a consultant, um, I also serve as director of the office um, and um, have been uh, serving as director of the office since its inception. Um, we worked uh, you know, and supported um, the department in sort of standing up the office. Um, and the office was um, first um, put into place um, in 2019 um, by the General Assembly. Um, and essentially what the General Assembly said is, you know, we need an office within the Department of Insurance that is gonna be tasked with really giving us a better understanding of healthcare cost trends and specifically how we can um, invest more in primary care. And so that was the um, initial purpose of the office. Um, the, off, the charge of the office has expanded a little bit um, in the last uh, session of the General Assembly, and we can talk a little bit about um, more about that in a few minutes. Um, but that was sort of the initial purpose of the office. And so when we came into being, the first thing that we did um, was really sort of dig into the data and try to get a better understanding of what currently is happening um, in healthcare costs in Delaware. And um, what's probably not a surprise to you or to any of your um, partners um, is that we found that Delaware primary care providers were not really being paid enough to sort of fully um, uh, capitalize on the opportunity of primary care. And so we made some recommendations um, and those recommendations included increasing the amount that we spend on primary care in Delaware, um, sort of reallocating some of the, uh, what have been typically price increases to um, the, for non-professional services, taking a portion of that price increase and reallocating it to primary care. Um, and then also um, supporting the state to moving towards more value-based payment, which I think um, ACOs are, are so well positioned um, to support the state in doing. Um, so that was sort of our initial recommendations. And um, last session, the General Assembly took those recommendations, kind of um, uh, refined them a bit um, and put them into statute. And so we can talk a little bit more about that statute too in a few minutes. So um, I think one of the questions uh, that we have um, uh, with the triple aim and everything that we are trying to do from the primary care side, as you know, uh, you are familiar with our organization. Uh, yep. So uh, the, uh, the triple aim is one of the uh, main goal for, for all of us. And now with the accountable care organization, we actually took that to a different level. And um, now, uh, with the changes that's coming through uh, uh, through your office, um, how would that impact the ACOs? There are right now four ACOs in the state of Delaware, two of them are hospital-based and two of them are private ACOs. How would this impact us? What should we expect uh, in terms of the ACO? Sure. Um, so the first thing I think you can expect is that for your primary care providers, which are sort of who are moving along that care transformation continuum, who are able to offer um, an expanded scope of primary care services. And I think many of your practices are already sort of starting or, or have moved along that continuum. Um, you're gonna see higher reimbursements. Um, so one of, the, um, one of the pieces of the statute is to increase um, primary care reimbursement um, to a defined percentage. Mm -hmm. um, of total cost of care. And the other thing that the statute does, and specifically that the, the draft regulations that we released um, do, is also say that if you are providing services, primary care services, that would be paid for by Medicare on a, on a non-fee-for-service base, basis, 
um, but are not currently paid for um, on a fee for service basis or a non fee for service basis by commercial insurers, they need to start paying you for those services. So if you're doing um, uncompensated care management services that you don't have a revenue stream for, um, those sorts of things, basically the carriers need to um, expand um, their non-fee for service payments. And they need to meet certain requirements in terms of the percent of the total healthcare dollar that goes to primary care. Um, so that's what's sort of happening on the primary care side. Um, the, the other piece, and actually before I move on, one thing I want to make really clear about that is that, you know, the office has been explicit that increased reimbursement um, needs to come as part of sort of a statewide movement towards advanced primary care. And so you may wonder, well, what do you mean by that? Well, the Primary Care Reform Collaborative has started to think about what that includes. Over time, we don't expect this day one, this is sort of an evolution for all of us, but over time, it's gonna include things like integrated behavioral health. Mm -hmm. It's gonna include things like um, having folks who are on the primary care team who are really dedicated to supporting patients and connecting with social services, um, including things um, like care management, including things like 24 seven access to um, some type of care delivery that's not the emergency room. So what we're really hoping is that this increased investment um, helps to fund a lot of the initiatives, the care delivery initiatives that you all have probably been wanting to do for some time, um, but haven't really had um, the, the reimbursement streams um, to make those financially feasible. Um, the other piece that it does, and that's right, that's that, that's that PCP shortage. We'll talk about that as well. Um, and the other piece that it does is, you know, as you all maybe know, Delaware is a state that has one of the highest rates of per capita participation in, um, in MSSP programs, in, in CMS sort of accountable care MSSP programs. Um, so we have not- People are listening, so MSSP yeah. is the accountable care for Medicare. That's right, exactly. Accountable care for Medicare, thank you. And we haven't seen that on the commercial side, right? So on the Medicare side, lots of Delaware providers through your ACO, through the three other ACOs are participating in Medicare programs that aim to improve the quality of care, achieve that triple aim that you had up a minute ago and do so, um, you know, while also hoping to reduce costs, right? Yep, which is, is part of that triple aim. Um, and they've participated in Medicare programs to really sort of support them in achieving the triple aim, um, which are which is the Medicare share, Shared Savings Program. Um, on the commercial side, what we've heard from providers is we would love to be part, have programs like that with the commercial carriers, um, but we haven't really been able to agree on terms. And mm -hmm. what we hear from the carriers, we'd love to have programs like that with the providers, but we haven't really been able to agree on terms. Um, and so what the, what the statute and what the regulations do is essentially help give people some guidance and guardrails around how to get to terms um, that everybody can hopefully agree on. So um, I think uh, I gave the spoiler a little bit with when I was, this is our new format, so uh, I have to do some of the stuff on my own. So I think one of the big issue is um, the PCP primary care shortage. Um, yeah. Now from our side, um, I've been in the medical field for almost 23, 22 years. And I probably, as a person, uh, <clears throat> from the personal side, I probably did the most number of interviews uh, to hire a physician in the state of Delaware. Now, the state of Delaware also have a J1 uh, program for those um, who, uh, those um, regional areas where you don't have enough providers, so you can actually hire foreign graduates. Um, and they come and serve for about three years minimum. And I probably did about 30 J1 applications in the last uh, 20 years. Um, and many people don't really understand what these are, but with the hospitalist groups, with the primary care groups and other specialists, 
uh, if I'm, I may not be, if I tell you if it's more than 800 people, providers that I interviewed, that wouldn't be an exaggeration. So, but the shortage is still there. So I wasn't able to hire enough people. So yeah. um, how is this affecting, uh, like, do you have any, um, uh, any plans on addressing the primary care shortage? I know with the physician assistants and the nurse practitioners that we are utilizing, that helps. Um, and then there's also the claim base, uh, which uh, some people may not really understand. If you can kind of talk about those uh, so that we have a better understanding. Sure. Um, so the first thing I'll say is that I think there's a lot of consensus that um, in Delaware, primary care providers have not been paid enough um, to attract new primary care providers to the market, or in some case, retain the primary care providers that we have. And there was a study that was done by the Department of Health um, and, and Social Services not long ago that really sort of documented um, this. And it's also referred to in a report that um, we put out at the office uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the piece that I would really emphasize here is that if we remain solely focused on using additional dollars to attract only new MDs and DOs and even NPs and PAs, so physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, um, I think we're not gonna be successful. So I think what we really need to do is a couple of things. One is we need to pay primary care providers more, right? We're not paying primary care providers enough. Two, we need to compensate primary care teams for providing a full range of primary care services. And mm -hmm. we need to um, make clear um, that if we wanna achieve the triple aim, um, that will not occur through, you know, nine to five office visits, right? It needs to, with, a, with a physician or even with a nurse practitioner. What we really need is a primary care team that represents the full complement of expertise and experience that a variety of providers can bring. And we need to you know, allow the primary care physician and also the nurse practitioner and physician assistant to really practice at the top of their license, right? And so um, in some cases, that's going to include seeing patients. Um, but in other cases, it's gonna include um, coaching other members of the primary care team on how they can support patients. It's going to include looking at data and seeing patients as a population, identifying those that are um, most in need of the expertise of a physician, and also thinking about those that would benefit from care by other members of the care team. That could be a nurse practitioner, that could be a community health worker, that could be um, a behavioral health clinician, um, a wide variety of skill sets on that primary care team because primary care providers can't do it all alone. They need help. We don't have enough of them for, to do it all alone. And I would argue that beyond not having enough of them, it's not really the best use of their time or expertise. And so really thinking about how we use them more strategically, but also paying primary care um, in, a, in a fair and sustainable way. So I'm sure um, uh, our primary cares are happy to hear uh, that the state is working on uh, better payments. Now, um, the I think the other issue uh, with the payment uh, is one problem, but I think the representation of the uh, primary cares in the state committees uh, in some of these decision-making um, uh, departments, um, Hospitals are getting more, uh, more louder voices than we do. Um, and I, I was really hoping that ACO would be a way to fix those uh, representation issues so that uh, ACO can represent the, all of our private practices, which are mainly primary care. Um, anything that is uh, on, the, uh, on the way to maybe address those representation issues from your side? Sure. So a couple of suggestions I would make. One is um, we released um, draft regulations on Senate Bill 120 
Um, just a few weeks ago, we received public comment. Um, I don't believe we received any public comment directly from an ACO. So providing public comment on things is one way to have your voice heard. Um, we do have revised regulations that'll be coming out on um, March 1st. So um, would encourage you to take a look at those and, and feel free to, to give us your thoughts on them through the public comment process. Um, the other thing I would say is that the Primary Care Reform Collaborative is in the process of recruiting members for its work groups. And so um, you're, um, you know, I would reach out to them. We don't oversee that process. We're a separate agency, um, but we work co very collaboratively with them. And I would reach out to them and, and volunteer your time and, and your folks' time and let them know that you're here to provide input um, because I know that they're looking for folks to join those work groups. Yeah, you know, the um, uh, unrelated to this, um, you know, working with our primary care very closely. Um, sometimes we get direct messages, text messages. Even now, I'm getting messages. So uh, one of the issues um, there's these services available um, that sometimes Medicare makes these and Medicaid makes these services uh, available. But there's really no clear way of knowing who's going to provide these services. And primary care offices, they're already overwhelmed with so much that they do. And like today, um, so if I may just read you one of my messages. Sure. Um, uh, so this is, um, you know, is Medicare not paying for the um, uh, bathroom rehab, which uh, like the message was like this. I had to kind of Google it right away because sometimes you're in the middle of something and you don't know what this is talking about. So there is a service that actually some Medicare plans can pay for um, certain renovations for the patient's bathrooms. And patient, yep. patient hears this and then they, uh, the first thing that they come is their PCP. They don't go to their cardiologist and then they don't ask their cardiologist, write me a letter to qualify me for this. They come to their PCP. So I think hearing from, you, right. um, hearing from you that uh, PCP uh, payments uh, increase on the PCP payment is the uh, one of the main focus is uh, is actually really um, uh, helpful. Um, so my uh, next uh, question for you is, uh, I think part of what you are doing is um, ensuring the uh, compliance and uh, price uh, transparency in terms of the hospitals and the ambulatory payment uh, classifications for outpatient facilities. Hmm. So um, what do we have in place today in terms of um, uh, pricing? Uh, patients, do they even know that this is available to them? And I try to explain these in our live sessions, uh, but um, how are we going to ensure the compliance and the uh, compliance and the transparency on the uh, pricing? Sure. So I think there's a, a couple of questions built in there. So let me kind of try to break them down. And then at the end, you can let me know what I missed. But um, uh, the first question I heard was around hospital price transparency. And so I think what you may be referring to there is that there's a, a federal executive order that is requiring hospitals to post their prices. Is that? Yeah. And they um, do that already. Uh, there are some websites like Medicare websites uh, that yeah. make that available, but it's not uh, it's not very straightforward. So the, I, I, like if I'm just always thinking about my parents, if they were to use Medicare, uh, my dad is 81, mom is 71, how would they actually, how would they use that uh, complex system? And it's not easy, uh, but you're exactly right. That's what I'm referring to. Yes, absolutely. Um, so a couple of points on that. So one is just to clarify, um, that is a, a federal um, requirement. And so we do not have oversight over it. However, that being said, um, because we do have a responsibility as part of our state mandate to produce information and reports around pricing, uh, healthcare pricing in Delaware, we did include in our most recent report, a section on compliance essentially put in a table that showed which hospitals were complying, which ones were not, and how they were complying or not complying. Um, that's So one issue is basic compliance. Did you put the information up on your website, right? 
Um, and I'll tell you what we find is that hospitals, not only in Delaware, but nationally are generally not in compliance, not in full compliance with that requirement. And so the federal government is doing a variety of things to consider how they can make them in more compliance. One thing you might not be aware of is the fines for non-compliance are very low. And so when you have low fines for non-compliance, it's really hard to get people to comply, especially when it's something that they don't want to do. So, so actually that's, the compliance uh, is, uh, well, more than 85% of the hospitals are not uh, complying with the rule. That's right. That's what I said, is that, is that yeah. people are not complying with it. And I think one of the reasons why people are not complying is, one, they don't want people to know their prices, but two, the fine is low. So there's not a lot of incentive to comply. Um, <clears throat> the next piece that you raise is, um, you know, really around how, um, how are we going to um, make these sites better for consumers to be able to use them? Right. And, you know, I don't know if you've, so over the last probably 10 or 15 years, there's been um, what I think has been a positive evolution in the Medicare hospital compare site. It's still not good, but it's better. And it's gotten easier for consumers to use along the way. Um, I personally have used the um, nursing home compare site several times to try to find um, nursing home care for relatives. And that, I think that site has gotten better. I hope that over time the transparent the price transparency sites get better too, but you're mm -hmm. absolutely right that they are really not there right now. Um, I think the real purpose of having this data out there right now is for purchasers, um, large employers, health plans, health policy folks to be able to see the variation in price and sort of act as early adopters in information disseminators and get that information out to others. Um, but the first is sort of just basic exposure. So um, the exposure, uh, sometimes like when the hospital systems are so strong, uh, it doesn't work. So um, our um, numbers, uh, what's being paid to us is public uh, for um, fee for service for the private practices for Medicare is public. So, um, but when it comes to hospitals, the billing is very complicated. Many people really don't really understand uh, how it works. And I actually did, in one of our sessions, I did the comparisons. And um, even for us, even knowing the background, it's a lot of stuff going on there. So uh, being complex is one thing, but not complying with this is another thing. Uh, I think uh, perhaps there has to be some uh, some enforcement, some, some, uh, like if you're not penalized, like today when I was driving back here, um, there was a police uh, officer right behind me and then I slowed down. So I wasn't going to slow down otherwise. So, mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, when we see the enforcement, then we make changes in our behavior. So, and I think the hospitals do make those changes, those, they do respond better when there is a, uh, significant uh, consequences. Otherwise, they really don't change. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, do you see any um, uh, any role from your office for the um, anti-competitive uh, behavior, addressing the anti-competitive behavior? Uh, now, this is uh, even more problematic for our state because we are small and then there's only so many players, there are only so many players. Does your office have any role to address some of those issues? Sure. So the first thing I would say is that, you know, um, the work that we've done so far um, on, for example, market share and anti-competitive behavior in the state has been to publish data. So um, if you go to our reports, um, you'll see that we talk a lot about market concentration. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reports that we published, um, that we, we published in early um, 2021, um, was um, really uh, had a, a lot of discussion around the amount of market share that hospitals in the state control. Um, and one of the things that we found was that hospitals in the state of Delaware can control more than, and when I say control, they essentially have. Um, in some cases, more than 80% of the, 
of the discharges for their core service area, right? Mm -hmm. So every time um, hospitals have to publish something each year called a community benefit report. And in that report, they define what they see as their core service area, who they're really there to serve. And so what we did was we took those zip codes or that they defined as their core service area. And we said, okay, how many total discharges occur for individuals who live in those zip codes in a year? Um, and then we said, and how, what percent of those discharges were from a specific hospital? And what we found is, is that in some cases um, that's upwards of 80%. And, you know, nationally, we have a problem with um, hospital consolidation. It's not just in Delaware. Um, but we did find that the problem is intense in Delaware. Um, and it's certainly something that we felt the state and its stakeholders deserve to understand. And so um, dedicated a section of that report. Um, we also talked about um, consolidation on the health insurer side, right? So we have a dominant, you know, health insurer in Delaware, um, and we talked about that as well. Um, our job as an agency or as an office when it comes to this work is really to put the data out there and to inform um, the General Assembly and other policymakers about what's occurring. Um, and so... Um, you know, we have made that data available. There's more data to come um, that looks at um, not only market share, but also um, um, what may be um, price and, um, and the impact of price um, on, or the impact of market share on price. Um, also um, additional data to come um, that shares a little bit of information on um, the level of reserves um, that hospitals in the state are holding. So um, to, to sort of answer your question most directly, I think we, we do have a role in the sense that our role is to provide data on market trends in the state of Delaware. And that can include information on, um, uh, on market share, on prices, et cetera. Well, you know, the, uh, this last question is related to um, the private practice again. So, um, and you know, I'm not going to be too humble about um, what I have done for private practices in Delaware. Um, because of me, uh, I was able to do so many, so to keep so many private practices, pri uh, pro uh, providers in the private um, uh, offices. Well, this means um, uh, the open market. There's the um, uh, we are we are able to compete. Uh, we are able to actually provide this. Uh, the cost of the care uh, at a lower price. Um, so if we lose the private practices, uh, the cost is going to be uh, going up for everyone. Uh, and we are fighting. This is a fight for every day. Uh, me, my office, my team, my providers, uh, we are fighting with the system because, um, because we are under, uh, the for-profit label which uh, is total um, nonsense because we are providing services for Medicare, Medicaid, um, and commercial insurances. But uh, I was actually, I was in a meeting with Congresswoman last Monday um, discussing some of the healthcare related issues. And one issue was uh, we have like 25 patients who are homeless and okay. they have Medicaid. So well, this is, uh, this is a problem, right? So this is uh, like, just because we are for profit doesn't mean that we don't provide care. So um, I just want to make sure that the, um, and I think that's what I'm hearing from you, which is uh, very helpful. Uh, the, the value for, uh, for primary care, for private practices should be uh, highlighted and should be protected because uh, we don't have the big uh, dollars behind us uh, supporting us. Um, as you know, like nonprofit is just a label of our hospital systems, except one, uh, they're all uh, big profit centers uh, and they're very costly for our uh, people. Um, when I do case conferences every day with our team, well, we look at these, um, you know, one of the uh, United uh, Health dual plan. So these are Medicare patients with, um, uh, they have Medi Medicare, Medicaid uh, eligibility. And, 
it's, it's not about just providing care anymore for the, that group of patients. It's understanding their social situation, understanding their um, uh, day to day, what they go through, and what we can do, like the food and insecurity is one, transportation is another one. And we have to take care of all those problems. Everything comes back to the primary care at the end of the day. So we do whatever we can from our side, and we are also trying to support. Uh, our uh, society by these sessions and hopefully uh, people are benefiting from this and um, uh, I really appreciate you uh, joining us and uh, answering our questions. Uh, did you want to add anything before we uh, close the session? No, just uh, the only thing I would add is that I think um, the issues that you just brought up are, are so important and um, you know we the state has made it clear um, that it wants to provide more support for primary care and primary care providers. Um, I think the state has also made it clear that um, those types of services um, are important. For example, helping to connect patients who are experiencing food insecurity. Um, but also that you know the primary care physician um, can't be the person who's responsible for all of that because that's just too much to ask any one person to do, right? And so really thinking about how we can best deploy care teams um, to ensure that patients receive um, the care that they need, that their social drivers of health are addressed as well as their clinical drivers of health, as well as their behavioral health issues. Um, and, and really trying to all pull together to think about um, how we can do this in an effective and sustainable way. So thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you again. Uh, so I'm sure we'll uh, see you soon. Um, until next time, uh, please stay safe and uh, we'll see you soon. All right, take you. All right, so um, my uh, next speaker um, is uh, on the revenue cycle management side. So Carlos, Hey, come on. Can you see me? Hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, so uh, we are going to do the reporting. Um, so what I'll do is I'll actually uh, open PowerPoint for this section uh, as part of the presentation. Um, so you let me know how you see this. Uh, Sounds good. And um, introduce yourself uh, briefly. Of course. Um, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me here, Kamal. As you mentioned, uh, my name is Carlos Meinhardt, and I'm one of the senior client managers for the RCM team here at United Medical. And today I'll be reviewing some of the reporting capabilities that our practice management system, which is SPM, uh, currently has, and how our team uses this to to run some of the day-to-day -day tasks and also to provide feedback to our clients. So um, we can just start with the PowerPoint and I'll briefly go through it. Um, so SPM offers a variety of reports and depending on, it, come on, if you want to stay on the previous slide, uh, depending on the needs of the, that the provider office has. However, today we just wanted to focus on, on the three types of reports that we use the most at United Medical, which are the daily reporting, the monthly reporting and the scheduling. We also want to introduce QuickBase, which is a, an application development platform that we use here on a daily basis to do pretty much everything uh, from tracking our daily productivity in all of our departments to managing a variety of projects. Um, Kamal, I went back in the, the previous meeting that we had, uh, the previous live session, and reviewed some of my notes. And it was interesting to find that we didn't have QuickBase when we first started. And as we started working with more clients and had more complex processes with all the different specialists that we, that we deal with, it was important that we had a, a business database that we could use to manage all this information. So I found that pretty interesting. Um, yeah. So um, like I said, we gathered the information from the PN system and uploaded to QuickBase so that we can, can compile all of the financial reports for our clients. Um, I'm gonna start with the daily reporting, Kamal. Uh, this transaction detail report is one of the reports that is mostly used by our RCM team. Uh, we run this report on a daily basis to track productivity, whether it is uh, corrections from our RCM team, AR team, 
uh, total payments posted by our payment posting department or um, coding entries made by our coding team. Also provider offices, they can use this report to track the charges, payments and adjustments based on, on the needs that they have. And as you can see, it's customizable. It's pretty customizable. You can select a specific user if you want, or again, depends on the provider needs. The report on the right side, come on, is the procedure analysis uh, report, uh, which is we, which we use on a month-to-month -month basis, pretty much. Um, this report uh, includes CPT counts, charges, and payments, and adjustments, uh, and we upload this report into QuickBase uh, on a monthly basis. If you want to go to the next slide, Kamal, um, this report is the scheduling report. Uh, this report is used to track the appointments um, from our provider offices. It can also be customized based on the provider needs. And at least I started getting more familiar with this report uh, once the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Uh, we started to keep track of the practices that had a decrease in the number of their appointments. And it helped us identify which practices were staying a little bit behind in the total number of appointments, which then allowed us to push uh, the telemedicine use for those practices a little bit more so that they wouldn't stay behind um, and their revenues wouldn't be affected as much. Um, now, um, with the QuickBase reporting, um, we have, as some of you may know, we have 23 different specialties that we have currently as, as clients. And we understand that each specialty requires a unique setup. Um, therefore, we have to adapt the way that we do the reporting for those clients. Uh, one example that I can give you is a nephrologist, he, they may wanna see a report for how many dialysis codes were billed on a monthly basis, which is something that a cardiologist does not need because they don't do any dialysis. So we have adapted our reporting uh, based on the specialty and the reports that we provide to those clients. And you guys are updating uh, those uh, categories almost every month. Correct. Uh, in case if there are any new uh, procedure codes uh, as part of that specialty. That's correct, yes. So come on, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, this is our quick base reporting, uh, the denial reporting that we use, and this is based on the preventable type. These are the denial reports, which show us the correction that or team made uh, during the previous three months. Um, this, uh, these corrections are broken down by a preventable type, and this stem from the source of correction that is being entered by, by your team. Uh, these are unique categories uh, that Kamal, you established several years, uh, a few years ago. And the idea of the report is to tell us, to, for us to be able to tell the client how their claims are being processed, what's delaying the claim payment, and if there's something that could be prevented from the client side, we wanna we wanna point that out so that the client can can fix their um, any issues that may be causing that that delay. Yeah, I think one of the main things that we uh, we we want to highlight is um, when we started versus what we have today. Mm -hmm. uh, in time, we made a lot of updates uh, based on the need. Uh, if there's a need, that we are able to make. Uh, adjustments and we are able to adapt these changes and that's part of the system that we are um, we are able to uh, develop um, and I think um, like correct we're able to comfortably talk about this so because you are part of that system all right and Kamal what, one of now that you mentioned that one of those updates that we created in the last uh, couple of years is the like the provider specialty is now included in the reports so we can compare similar type of groups that's something that we didn't have before. And it makes it more meaningful to clients because they often want to see how they're comparing to, 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 to a peer or to a similar group. I think so you say that all the time. We don't want to compare apples to oranges, right? So um, yes, now uh, the next report is the main, the main category by client specific. This report provides a breakdown of um, based on the denial origin uh, check-in versus check-out. Um, check-in is typically any insurance type of denials that our team is correcting. Let's say an uh, incorrect insurance was billed for a patient, an inactive insurance was billed, or uh, incorrect ID was entered uh, for that insurance that was billed. Uh, we make those corrections. Uh, we resubmit the claims to the insurance. 
and we provide the feedback at the end of the month to the client so that they know uh, what's being done incorrectly. On the checkout side, uh, it's typically if a CPT code was built incorrectly or a modifier was missed by the checkout staff, we usually um, also include it in the report and review it with them um, on a monthly basis. So now come out this report. It's a little more detailed report and summarizes the total corrections per denial code uh, that our team uh, had in the, in the previous three months. So it just gives it's a little more detailed breakdown of each of the corrections that we made and the, what the client can correct on their, on their end. Um, I have a couple more slides, Kamal. Um, we just also wanted to show a little bit of the financial reporting and- I think it's just a little bit slow. Um, that's, that's why, are you able to see it? Yeah, I can see it, I can see it. Okay. Um, this is a report that shows a breakdown of the charges, payments and adjustments for one specific line during the year 2021 and 2022. Um, it's the first, one of the first reports that we have on our annual month reports and uh, it's very useful for the clients just to see where they stand in terms of productivity and the payments that they're receiving. Um, so Pretty much, um, uh, Carlos, these reports, um, I, I'm gonna actually um, get to some of the others. So these are the reports that you are, uh, our team, uh, are sending to the providers on a monthly basis. So our providers, our clients are receiving these um, reports every month in the same format. Um, the, if there are any changes that's made, um, that may be the only thing that they see, uh, but the rest of them are gonna be, uh, the main thing is consistency and the systematic, like everything is happening. Uh, every month in the same way, so then they can make these comparisons. So um, the uh, I know we have a couple other slides, and I may actually ask you to come back um, for this. Uh, of course. Somehow we are still uh, struggling with the time management. Every time we, I feel like uh, Sean can come up, actually, every time I feel like we don't have enough, um, uh, enough uh, topic. Um, Carlos, you can stay. Um, oh, I'll stay, okay. Uh, so every time I feel like we don't have enough topic, um, apparently we have too much because 3 p.m. Uh, bariatric. Creeping up on us, yeah. <laughs> so uh, now since Carlos is also from a uh, background, um, similar background uh, in terms of the country, um, well, different countries, but yeah. um, um, his uh, where he's from and where I'm from, we do have similar issues. And we are kind of used to the picture that you see here. Uh, so, but uh, one, one thing that I want, uh, uh, I want us to kind of uh, really understand uh, when we were preparing for these sessions, we do say a lot of stuff in between um, um, different topics. And when I was explaining this to Sean, I said, okay, we need to make um, our point very clear with the image. So, because when you see something is coming uh, and then when people are not listening, this is, uh, well, it's scary, number one. Number two, it's, um, it's coming. Um, now, Carlos, uh, you, from uh, his Venezuela background, he's used to this graph. From my Turkey background, I'm used to this graph. Um, I'm slightly older than these guys, but uh, not more than a couple of years. So yeah. uh, the problem is now this is becoming the norm. So uh, Sean is not used to this. Um, so now he's gonna get used to this because it's coming. Um, I don't wanna scare anyone. I just want people to prepare. So why the national debt is over 30 trillion. The inflation numbers are, every month is a record breaking numbers uh, and it's coming. So. Uh, Sean actually prepped a lot of good um, uh, uh, slides for these for us to discuss, uh, and I don't want to uh, rush them through. And what we'll do is next week uh, we have the clinical um, guest, uh, Dr. Vani Singh, on the non-surgical bariatric um, uh, weight loss approach. Um, she's part of United Medical Clinic, but we'll probably spend the rest of the time for this topic with uh, Sean, everything that you prepped for. Um, so uh, I wanna make sure that we can spend 
enough time, but uh, just kind of a little um, uh, maybe a couple spoiler here is sure. let me just see if I can bring this up. Um, I thought I saved it, but I cannot find it now. So um, the um, just the gas prices in the United States compared to six months ago, um, seven months ago, is 50% more. Uh, many people don't understand this. When inflation is 7.5%, uh, that's the new record, but that doesn't mean much because what's uh, impacting our life may be average in that 7.5%, but what, where we spend the money is uh, going to be in more expensive line items like the gas and like the uh, energy and other stuff. And this is happening everywhere. So uh, I want you to go to the weekend with this picture in your head. And as young people, you guys are, you don't spend all of your money and you make some preparation for the future. And uh, Sean, uh, what we will do is, since you spend a lot of time uh, on these with me, um, we, we will spend proper amount of time for this next week. Uh, but the global uh, economic uh, recession is going to be our uh, one of our topics, uh, as well as the Neuralink uh, updates that we are going to have. So we have five minutes to Bariatric Friday. So uh, we'll say goodbye now, but uh, we'll be back next week. Thank you so much, guys.